Well, welcome to our morning service from Libanus Church. We're really glad to have you join us and we hope and we pray that you will be blessed with us as we worship a saviour who is worth it all. All of our praise, all of our hymns, all of our songs of joy, our saviour is worth it all for who he is and what he has done for us. If you look on our website at www.libanussermons.com, you will see the list of uh, this week's street names. As a church, we're praying street by street through every street in Morriston. Over the course of the year, wherever you live in our area, we were going to pray for you. We're going to bear you in prayer. So please do check out our website and have a look which streets we're praying for this week. Because as a church, we deeply care that the gospel of Jesus Christ reaches everyone. Because everybody needs to hear that Christ died to bring about the forgiveness of sins. And we're going to begin our time together, our time of worship. We're going to begin by singing a great old hymn, a favourite of many, I'm sure. Guide me, O thy great Jehovah. now before our great heavenly father in prayer let's pray together father we thank you that my mere mumblings are heard by the almighty supreme god reigning in the heavens we thank you that no matter how weak no matter how timid no matter how inadequate our prayers might be we have a God who cares so much that he listens to the groanings, to the moanings, to the grumblings of our heart. We pray now that as we come in worship to you, as we come before your word, as we read the great scripture that tells us so much of you, as we come and we sit under the preaching and proclaiming of your word, we pray that 
all of us will be touched. All of us will leave being a little bit different, transformed by the reality of what you do for people. Staggered and overwhelmed by the love that you had for me. The love that sends you to the cross. The love that sent you to die in my place. Though I was deserving, Christ died. Lord, we just as a church accept that we would be nowhere without you. Without your grace, we would be nowhere. We would be lost. But with you by you, because of you, we have a great hope, a great promise of the things yet to come. And we do pray, Lord, that in this sermon that might be something for everyone, for every single person who is watching this video, whether for the first time or the hundredth time, whoever is watching this video, we pray that they might hold on firm to you. We pray that they might have a great reality of who you are. We pray that whatever people are going through, whatever the struggles are, we pray that your words of life might comfort their heart. We pray that everybody might find peace. Everyone might find comfort. Everyone might find forgiveness in Jesus Christ and in him alone. We do pray, Lord, for those who are having their, their vaccines this week. We pray for those who have had their vaccines. We pray for those who might be feeling the, the aftermath, those who might be feeling weak or tired at the moment. And we pray that the love of Jesus Christ, a love which cannot be compared to, we pray that that love will be over and upon everyone who needs it in their time of weakness. Lord, we give thanks for your common grace, for your grace of vaccine for your grace in the hospital staff who preside and look after us we pray for the nurses and doctors and for all of the volunteers and workers who are working flat out to deliver the vaccines across wales we pray lord that you would be their strength if they're feeling weak if they're feeling run down we pray that in jesus christ they would be renewed they would be strengthened. And Father, we thank you that throughout this virus, you have kept your church. You have not forsaken us. You have not left us. We thank you, Lord, that the doors might be closed. But the word of God is not. We thank you that your mouth is not closed. That your voice can still be heard. We thank you that there is still opportunity for people to seek you while you may be found. Lord, we pray for the rest of the service that you might bless us, that might, you might bring us into a greater knowledge of your Saviour and of your Son. Father, bring us closer to Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. If you've got your Bibles this morning, we're going to be reading from Romans 5. The reading today is taken from Romans chapter 5 and we'll be starting at verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoiced in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Well, before we come and we have our sermon, we're first going to sing another hymn of praise. Another song of praise to the Almighty. We're going to sing the great truth. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe.
before we come and we look at God's word in more detail, I'm just going to pray and ask that he would be with us. Father, we thank you that when we need you most, you are there for us. And so we just come to you now and we pray that in the few minutes that we're going to spend thinking of your truth, thinking of your glory, thinking of your name, we pray that you might be glorified through it. Bless us, we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to do something a little bit different this week. What we're going to do this week is instead of having a psalm in the evening, I'm almost going to split the sermon up into two parts. As I was looking and preparing this passage, there was just so much richness, so much depth, so much joy to be found in these passages. And so I didn't want to leave out anything from these five verses in Romans. So we're going to almost do a part one this morning and then in the evening we'll have our part two, our second instalment on these few verses. And so hopefully we'll look really at how we're saved, the great change that has happened with us as Christians, how much we have to be thankful for. And hopefully you'll be blessed morning and evening. Now, for Christians, people who follow Jesus, people who are trusting in Jesus, they were not initially called Christians. The name Christian was a phrase, it was quite a derogatory phrase that was used to describe these people who were following and chasing after Jesus. But initially, a lot of theologians and historians believe that Christians were initially called followers of the way. And people believe that is the term that was given to Christians. People who follow the way. Those people who are following a different way, a new way, a unique way. And this morning we're really going to be going to be studying and looking at exactly that. What is the way to heaven? How do we get to heaven? What is the method by which we are saved? And I hope this acts as a reminder for you at how, how much it costs, how you are saved, how you can one day enter into heaven. And so my first point it's a very uh, simple point. My first point is by. I want us to be focusing on the means by which we are saved. This is the starting point. There is no way that we can be saved except by faith. And we see this very clearly in verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There could be a whole sermon on that one verse alone. But this is the reality of the gospel. And in this verse, we see the gospel laid clear. This is what Jesus can do in our lives. And the first thing I want to draw our attention to is the phrase, since we have been. Now, this is addressing Christians. This makes it clear that we cannot really go any further into this passage without first provoking us to think, do these verses speak of my life? Are these verses true of me? Do I know what it means to be a Christian? These verses are clearly set out for Christians. And for those of us who know Jesus, the verse reminds us, that we have been justified. We have been justified. Every one of us, not just the top 10% spiritual people in Libanus Church, but every one of us, every single Christian has been justified by God himself. For justification is, is an imputed gift. It is a God-given gift. And it has been given to every Christian. We have to understand that one of the most central themes towards being justified is actually a relationship with him. It's a union with him. One of the huge themes of the gospel of justification is that we can be with God. 
that we can be with him. And in many senses, what is hell? Hell is a, a place that is completely separated and removed from God. It is somewhere that is devoid of the presence of God. It is somewhere where the only presence of God is his wrath and his anger. It is somewhere where God has removed all of his blessings. All of his acts of common grace have all been removed. Communion with God, a relationship with God, union with God is such a fundamental issue for the gospel. We must ensure that we are found in Jesus. We need to make sure that we know him, that we have a relationship with him. We must ensure that we have a union with God. The problem with our spiritual lives is that God is without sin and we are not. No matter how well we've tried to behave, no matter how many bad habits we've tried to stop, the reality is God is perfect. And we are not. God is completely without any error, without any evil, without any ounce of impurity. We are not deserving to be with such a God. We have missed the minimum standard. And so we cannot have a relationship with God. Something I like to do is I like to say I'm either going to have a congratulations meal or a commiserations meal. Maybe I've applied for a new job. Maybe it was for an examination at school. Maybe it's, if I can get this bit of work done, I'm going to go and celebrate with a big fancy meal. And if I don't get that work done, if I don't get that job, if I don't do well in that exam, well, I'll have a commiserations meal to cheer myself up. And the reason why I'm sure I often set those standards, either a commiseration meal or a celebratory meal, is because I know that there is a huge and real chance that I'm not going to meet the standard. There's a huge set that if I set a requirement for having this lovely meal, there's a chance that I won't be part of it. The reality is we have missed the standard of God. We failed to get anywhere near what God asks us to be. We failed, we've messed up. And what it means to be justified is that God says, even though you have missed my standards, God declares us just. God declares us righteous. God declares us worthy. Of course, we're not worthy by our own means. We're not worthy by our own standards. But by faith in Jesus, we can be forgiven. By faith in Jesus, we can know what it is to be worthy of a union, of a relationship with God himself. I've got nothing to offer God. I've got nothing to win him round. And this is the gospel. Though I don't deserve it, God declares me righteous because Christ died for me. Justification is a permanent declaration that we who are undeserving can be eternally united, eternally connected with Jesus. The final thing I want to say on this idea is that we are justified by faith. Justification cannot be removed. Justification is eternal. Who God has declared righteous can never be declared unrighteous. If God says that you are justified, if you have accepted who Jesus Christ is, if you are justified before the supreme judge of eternity, who can say to you, but you've done this wrong? But you're undeserving. But you're unworthy. Who can say to you that you are not worthy? Who can say to you that you are undeserving if God himself has declared you just, justified and righteous before him? Nobody can challenge the rulings of God. 
And my second point is continuing to this verse and it's looking at the idea that all of this happens through Jesus. This one says that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Though we were once rebellious, though we once did things wrong, you can be at peace with God himself. As Christians, we've done things wrong. As Christians, we know that we've messed up. We know that there are things that we regret, things we wish that we could take back, things we wish we could fix that we just know we can't reverse. So often we can be kept up at night wishing that we could have done something differently, wishing that we could have changed things. So often we just wish that we could have done something different. Yet, you can know peace with God. If that's you, if you are that person who's kept up at night by guilt and shame, you can know peace. It's a bit like a large lake and on a cool, sunny, tranquil day, there's no movement, there's no ripples. The water just lays there still, calm and unmoving. And this is really big news because many of us will say we've had storms in our lives. We've had times that have shaken us, times that have been difficult, times where we've made mistakes. But if you accept Jesus Christ into your life, you can know peace. No matter what you've done wrong, no matter what you failed with, you can know peace and not just peace, but peace with God himself. This is a remarkable, life-changing news that in your life you can have peace. And this peace comes through our Lord Jesus Christ. Continuing to read into verse 2, through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Paul, when he is writing to the Romans, he seems to make it so very obvious that everyone who has peace with God, everyone who has been justified by God, he is declared righteous through the power of the set of the, through the power of the self-sacrificial work that Jesus performed on the cross. Paul makes it absolutely clear that there can be no other way. Paul does not say it is through our Lord Jesus Christ and. Paul does not say it is through the Lord Jesus Christ or. There is only one way to God. There is only one way to have this peace, and it is through Jesus Christ. And I want to make this absolutely clear this morning. If you think that you are right before God, if you think that you have peace in your life, you don't. It is a lie. Unless your peace comes from Jesus Christ himself, you have no peace at all. I want to be very firm. I don't want anyone to watch this sermon and, and not know, to not have clarity. I will not shy away from the exclusivity of the gospel. Your salvation must come from the blood of Jesus Christ alone. There is nothing else that can save. There is nothing else that can have power. There is nothing else that can replace the glory or need for the Saviour. You might think your life is fine. You might think you're doing okay in life. One of the largest lies that the devil has in this modern age is the great lie, you'll be fine. There's nothing to worry about. You'll be okay. You don't need this just yet. Maybe later. 
is a complete lie of this age. Because if you do not know Jesus, the reality is you are hopelessly and desperately lost. But if you know Jesus, rejoice in the Lord, be glad, be happy because you have such a hope, because you have been declared justified before God. There is a peace in your life, a peace that only Jesus can bring. Nobody else can bring the peace of Jesus Christ. Nobody else can do this work in your life. I wonder, have you accepted the great promise that God has given us? That your sin, everything that you've done wrong in your life, can be and will be forgiven if you accept Christ into your life. Do you know this great hope? Because my third point is into. If you have peace through Jesus, it gets even better. Because verse 2 continues that through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. If you know Jesus, then you who were once on the outside of God's family have been wonderfully brought into his family. Through his grace, you have been brought into his presence, into where he is. You can know the grace of God. And the grace of God is referencing everything that God gives us that we do not deserve. Everything that we are unworthy to have, but we have because of Jesus. You have been brought into that. There's no wonder the Christians should be filled with joy. There's no wonder the Christians should have a smile on their face. There's no wonder the Christians should sing so many hymns constantly. There's no wonder we should be a people of song because of what Christ has done for us. Because we have been brought into grace. We who are undeserving have been wonderfully saved. And one day, I will be in heaven. One day, every Christian will be in heaven. One day, every Christian will be face to face with God himself. Will experience the beauty, the joy, the splendour, the majesty of being before a holy, pure, perfect God. And let me just remind you, you do not deserve that. You do not deserve to be in the midst of the presence of this God. I say it this way, you don't even deserve the next breath you take. I think as people, we can be so entitled. We can be so self-entitled. We think, I deserve this. I'm worthy of this. I have earned this. The reality is you haven't. There's very little that you are deserving of. There's very little that you've earned. And what you do deserve, what you have earned, it's not very good. This is what grace is. You are undeserving of the riches of Jesus Christ. And yet, through him, he, God gives them to you anyway. You who are undeserving are rich beyond all measure. Now, when I think of the word access, in verse 2, the word access is used. And when I think of this word, I'm reminded of my work in the guild hall. Now, I've got a, a name badge. And with my name badge, I go up to this gate that's locked, I press my uh, name badge against the sensor and the doors open and I have access to where I need to be. If you're a Christian watching this this morning, 
through Jesus, you have access to God himself. You can live with him. You can dwell with him. You can be in the place that you most clearly need. You can be with the saviour who died for you. The saviour who loved you. The God who created you, you can have a relationship with them. You can be with them. Just like through my security pass, I have access into my workplace. As a Christian, through Jesus Christ, you can have access into the realms of glory. The richness of what God has. I love the end of this too. Verse 2 is the destiny, the destiny of every Christian. You were once outside his kingdom and he has brought you into his glory. The end of this too says, the hope of the glory of God. One day we will be brought into that, that glory, a hope fully realised and confirmed, one day we will be where he is. One day, if you're trusting in Jesus, you will be where he is. And all the pain of this world, all the hardship of this world, it won't last. One day we will be with him. How are we saved? What is the road by which we can come to salvation? It is by being justified by faith through the Lord Jesus Christ, being brought into the grace of God. This morning, what a gospel, what a hope, what a saviour. Amen. Well, we're now going to sing a hymn of praise to close. And we're going to sing the great hymn, I will glory in my Redeemer. And this hymn has got beautiful words and it reminds us of everything that God has done for us. We are all loved so much by the Almighty. This is what one verse says in the song we're about to sing. I will glory in my Redeemer whose priceless blood has ransomed me. Mine was the sin that drove the bitter nail and hung him on that judgment tree. I will glory in my Redeemer, who crushed the power of sin and death, my only Saviour, before the Holy Judge, the Lamb who is my righteousness, the Lamb who is my righteousness. If you're a Christian this morning, sing loudly and proudly to our great God, our great Saviour, my only saviour.